A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Lingle. Chapter 1. Mrs. What's It? It was a dark and stormy night. In her attic bedroom, Margaret Murray, wrapped in an old patchwork quilt, sat on the foot of her bed and watched the trees tossing in the frenzied lashing of the wind. Behind the trees, clouds scuttled frantically across the sky. Every few moments, the moon ripped through them, creating wraith-like shadows that raced along the ground. The house shook. Wrapped in her quilt, Meg shook. She wasn't unusually afraid of weather. It's not just the weather, she thought. It's the weather on top of everything else. On top of me. On top of Meg Murray doing everything wrong. School. School was all wrong. She'd been dropped down to the lowest section in her grade. That morning, one of the teachers had said crossly, Really, Meg, I don't understand how a child with parents as brilliant as yours are supposed to be can be such a poor student. If you don't manage to do a little bit better, you'll have to stay back next year. During lunch, she'd roughhoused a little to try to make herself feel better, and one of the girls had scornfully said, After all, Meg, we aren't grammar school kids anymore. Why do you always act like such a baby? And on the way home from school... Walking up the road with her arms full of books, one of the boys had said something about her dumb baby brother, and at this, she'd thrown the books on the side of the road and tackled him with every ounce of strength she had, and arrived home with her blouse torn and a big bruise under one eye. Sandy and Dennis, her ten-year-old twin brothers, who'd gotten home from school an hour earlier than she, were disgusted. Let us do the fighting when it's necessary, they told her. A delinquent, that's what I am, she thought grimly. That's what they'll be saying next. Not mother, but them. Everybody else, I wish father. But it was still not possible to think about her father without the danger of tears. Only mother could talk about him in a natural way, saying, When your father gets back... Get back from where? And when? Surely her mother must know what people were saying. Must be aware of the smugly vicious gossip. Surely it must hurt her as it did Meg. But if it did, she gave no outward sign. Nothing ruffled the serenity of her expression. Why can't I hide it too? Meg thought. Why do I always have to show everything? The window rattled madly in the wind, and she pulled the quilt close about her. Curled up on one of her pillows, a gray fluff of kitten yawned, showing its pink tongue, tucked its head under again, and went back to sleep. Everybody was asleep. Everybody except Meg. Even Charles Wallace, that dumb baby brother who had an uncanny way of knowing when she was awake and unhappy, and who had come, so many nights, tiptoeing up the attic stairs to her. Even Charles Wallace was asleep. How could they sleep? All day on the radio there had been hurricane warnings. How could they leave her up in the attic on the rickety brass bed, knowing that the roof might be blown right off the house, and she tossed out into the wild night sky to land who knows where? Her shivering grew uncontrollable. You asked to have the attic bedroom, she told herself savagely. Mother let you have it because you're the oldest. It's a privilege, not a punishment. Not during a hurricane, it isn't a privilege, she said aloud. She tossed the quilt down on the foot of the bed and stood up. The kitten stretched luxuriously and looked up at her with huge, innocent eyes. Go back to sleep, Meg said. Just be glad you're a kitten and not a monster like me. She looked at herself in the wardrobe mirror and made a horrible face, bearing a mouthful of teeth covered with braces. Automatically, she pushed her glasses into position, ran her fingers through her mouse brown hair so that it stood wildly on end, and let out a sigh almost as noisy as the wind. The wide wooden floorboards were cold against her feet. Wind blew in the crevices about the window frame, in spite of the protection the storm stash was supposed to offer. She could hear the wind howling in the chimneys. From all the way downstairs, she could hear Fortinbras, the big black dog, starting to bark. He must be frightened, too. What was he barking at? Fortinbras never barked without reason. Suddenly, she remembered that when she'd gone to the post office to pick up mail, she'd heard about a tramp who was supposed to have stolen twelve sheets from Mrs. Buncombe, the constable's wife. They hadn't caught him, and maybe he was heading for the Murray's house right now isolated on a back road, and it was, they this time, maybe he'd been after more than sheets. Meg hadn't paid much attention to the talk about the tramp at the time, because the postmistress, with a sugary smile, had asked if she'd heard from her father lately.
She left the little room and made her way through the shadows of the main attic, bumping against the ping-pong table. Now we'll have a bruise on my hip on top of everything else, she thought. Next she walked into her old doll's house, Charles Wallace's rocking horse, the twin electric cranes. Why must everything happen to me? she demanded of a large teddy bear. At the foot of the attic stairs, she stood still and listened. Not a sound from Charles Wallace's room on the right. On the left, in her parents' room, not a rustle from her mother sleeping alone in the great double bed. She tiptoed down the hall and into the twins' room, pushing again at her glasses as though they could help her see better in the dark. Dennis was snoring, and Sandy murmured something about baseball and subsided. The twins didn't have any problems. They weren't great students, but they weren't bad ones either. They were perfectly content with their succession of Bs and occasional A or C. They were strong and fast runners and good at games, and when cracks were made about anybody in the Murray family, they weren't made about Sandy and Dennis. She left the twins' room and went on downstairs. Fortinbras had stopped barking. It wasn't the tramp this time. Then Fort would go on barking if anybody was around. But suppose the tramp does come. Suppose he had a knife. Nobody lives near enough to hear if it was screamed and screamed. Nobody care anyhow. I'll make myself some cocoa, she decided. That'll cheer me up. And if the roof blows off, at least I won't go off with it. In the kitchen, a light was already on, and Charles Wallace was sitting at the table drinking milk and eating bread and jam. He looked very small and vulnerable sitting there alone in the big-fashioned kitchen. A little blonde boy in a faded blue Dr. Denton's, his feet swinging a good six inches above the floor. Hi, he said cheerfully. I've been waiting for you. From under the table where he was lying, Charles Wallace's feet, hoping for a calm or two, Fortinbras raised his slender dark head in greeting to Meg, and his tail thumped against the floor. Fortinbras had arrived on their doorstep, a half-grown puppy, scrawny and abandoned one winter night. He was, Meg's father had decided, part Lewin settler and part greyhound, and he had a slender dark beauty that was all his own. "'Why didn't you come up to the attic?' Meg asked her brother, speaking as though he was the least her own age. I've been scared stiff. Too windy up there in the attic of yours, the little boy said. I knew you'd be down. I put some milk on the stove for you. It ought to be hot by now. How did Charles Wallace always seem to know about her? How could he always tell? He never knew, or seemed to care, what Dennis or Sandy were thinking. It was his mother's mind and Meg's that he probed with frightening accuracy. Was it because people were a little afraid of him that they whispered about the Murray's youngest child, who was rumored to be not quite bright? I've heard that clever people often have some normal children, Meg had once overheard. The two boys seemed to be nice, regular children, but that unattractive girl and the baby boy certainly aren't all there. It was true that Charles Wallace seldom spoke when anybody was around, so that many people thought that he had never learned to talk and it was true that he hadn't talked until he was almost four. Meg would turn white with fury when people looked at him and clucked, shaking their heads sadly. "'Don't worry about Charles Wallace, Meg,' her father had once told her. Meg remembered it very clearly because it was shortly before he went away. "'There's nothing the matter with his mind. He just does things differently and at his own pace.' "'I don't want him to grow up to be dumb like me,' Meg had said." Oh, my darling, you're not dumb, her father had answered. You're like Charles Wallace. Your development has to go at its own pace. It doesn't just happen at the usual pace. How do you know, Meg had demanded. How do you know I'm not dumb? Isn't it just because you love me? I love you, but that's not what it tells me. Mother and I have given you a number of tests, you know. That was true. Meg had realized that some of the games her parents played with her were tests of some kind, and that they had been more for her and Charles Wallace than for the twins. IQ test, you mean? Yes, some of them. Is my IQ okay? More than okay. What is it? That I'm not going to tell you, but it assures me that both you and Charles Wallace will be able to do pretty much whatever you like when you grow up to yourselves. You'll just have to wait till Charles Wallace starts to talk on his own. You'll see. How right he had been about that, though he himself had left before Charles Wallace began to speak. Suddenly, 
and with none of the usual baby preliminaries, using entire sentences. How proud he would have been. You better check the milk, Charles Wallace said to Meg now, his diction clearer and cleaner than most five-year-olds. You know that you don't like it when it gets a skin on top. You put more than twice enough milk in here. Meg peered into the saucepan. Charles Wallace nodded serenely. I thought Mother might like some. I might like what? A voice said, and there was their mother standing in the doorway. Coco, Charles Wallace said. Would you like a liverwurst and cream cheese sandwich? I'll be happy to make you one. That would be lovely, Mrs. Murray said, but I can make it myself if you're busy. No trouble at all. Charles Wallace slid down from his chair and trotted over to the refrigerator, his pajamaed feet patting softly at the kittens. How about you, Meg? he asked. Sandwich? Yes, please, she said, but not liverwurst. Do we have any tomatoes? Charles Wallace peeped into the crisper. One. All right, if I use it on Meg, mother? To what better use could it be put? Mrs. Wallace smiled. But not so loud, please, Charles. That is, unless you want the twins downstairs, too. Let's be exclusive, Charles Wallace said. That's my new word for the day. Impressive, isn't it? Prestigious, Mrs. Murray said. Meg, come let me look at that bruise. Meg knelt at her mother's feet. The warmth and light of the kitchen had relaxed her so that her attic fears were gone. The cocoa steamed fragrantly in the saucepan. Geraniums bloomed on the window sills, and there was a bouquet of tiny yellow chrysanthemums in the center of the table. The curtains, wood with a blue and green geometrical pattern, were drawn and seemed to reflect their cheerfulness through the room. The furnace purred like a great, sleepy animal. The lights glowed with a steady radiance. Outside, alone in the dark, the wind still battered against the house, but the angry patter power that had frightened Meg while she was alone in the attic was subdued by the familiar comfort in the kitchen. Underneath Mrs. Murray's chair, Fortinbras let out a contented sigh. Mrs. Murray gently touched Meg's bruised cheek. Meg looked up at her mother, half in loving admiration, half in sullen resentment. It was not an advantage to have a mother who was a scientist and a beauty as well. Mrs. Murray's flaming red hair, creamy skin, and violet eyes with long, dark lashes seemed even more spectacular in comparison with Meg's outrageous plainness. Meg's hair had been passable as long as she wore it in tidy and braids, but she went into high school. It was cut. Now she and her mother struggled with putting it up, but one side would always come out curly and the other straight, so that she looked even plainer than before. "'You don't know the meaning of moderation, do you, my darling?' Mrs. Murray asked. "'A happy medium is something I wonder if you'll ever learn. "'That's a nasty bruise the Henderson boy gave you. "'By the way, shortly after you'd gone to bed, "'his mother called up to complain about how badly you'd hurt him. "'I told her that since she's a year older and at least twenty-five pounds heavier than you are, "'I thought I was the one who ought to be doing the complaining, "'but she seemed to think that it was all your fault.' I suppose it depends on how you look at it, Meg said. Usually, no matter what happens, people think it's my fault, even if I have nothing to do with it at all. But I'm sorry I tried to fight him. It's just been an awful week, and I'm just full of bad feeling. Mrs. Murray stroked Meg's shaggy head. Do you know why? I hate being an oddball, Meg said. It's hard on Sandy and Dennis, too. I don't know if they're really just like everybody else, or they're just able to pretend they are. I try to pretend, but it isn't any help. You're much too straightforward to be able to pretend to be what you aren't, Miss Murray said. I'm sorry, Megwit. Maybe if your father were here, he could help you, but I don't think I can do anything till you've managed to plow through some more time. Then things will be easier for you, but that isn't much help right now, is it? Maybe if I weren't so repulsive looking. Maybe if I were pretty like you. Mother's not a bit pretty. She's beautiful, Charles Wallace announced, slicing liverwurst. Therefore, I bet she was awful at your age. How right you are, Mrs. Mary said. Just give yourself some time, Meg. Let us on your sandwich, Mother? Charles Wallace asked. No, thanks. He cut the sandwich into sections put it on a plate, and set it in front of his mother. Yours will be along in just a minute, Meg. I think I'll talk to Mrs. Whatsit about you. Who's Mrs. Whatsit? Meg asked. 
I think I want to be exclusive about her for a while, Charles Wallace said. Onion salt? Yes, please. What's Mrs. What's it stand for? Mrs. Murray asked. That's her name, Charles Wallace answered. You know the old shingled house back in the woods that the kids won't go near because they say it's haunted? That's where they live. They? Mrs. What's it and her two friends. I was out with Fortinbras a couple of days ago. You and the twins were at school. Meg, we like to walk around the woods, and suddenly he took off at a squirrel, and I took off after him, and we ended up by the haunted house. So I met them by accident, as you might say. But nobody lives there, Meg said. Mrs. Wetz and her friends do. They're very enjoyable. Why don't you tell me about it before? Mrs. Murray asked. And don't you know you're not supposed to go off our property without permission, Charles? I know, Charles said. That's one reason I didn't tell you. I just rushed off after Fort and Brown without thinking, and then I decided, well, I better save them for an emergency anyhow. A fresh gust of wind began to took the house as it shook it, and suddenly the rain began to lash against the windows. I don't think I like this wind, Meg said nervously. We'll lose some shingles, that's for sure, Mrs. Murray said. But this house has stood for almost two hundred years, and I think it will last a little longer, Meg. There's been many a high wind upon this hill. But this is a hurricane, Meg wailed. The radio kept saying it was a hurricane. It's October, Mrs. Murray told her. There's been storms in October before. As Charles Wallace gave Meg her sandwich, Fortinbras came out from under the table. He gave a long, low growl, and they could see the dark fur slowly rising on his back. Meg felt her own skin prickle. "'What's wrong?' she asked anxiously. Fortinbras stared at the door that opened into Mrs. Murray's laboratory, which was in the own stole dairy, right off the kitchen. Beyond the lab, a pantry led outdoors, though Mrs. Murray had done her best to train the family to come into the house through the garage or front door, not through the lab. But it was the lab door, not the garage door, toward which Fortinbras was growling. You didn't leave any nasty-smelling chemicals cooking over a Bunsen burner, did you, Mother? Charles Wallace asked. Mrs. Murray stood up. No, but I think I'd better go see what's upsetting for anyhow. It's the tramp. I'm sure it's the tramp, Med said nervously. What tramp? Charles Wallace asked. They said that at the post office this morning that a tramp stole all of Miss Buckingham's sheets. We'd better sit on the pillowcases, then, Mrs. Murray said lightly. I don't think even a tramp would be out on a night like this, Meg. But that's probably why he is out, Meg wailed, trying to find a place not to be out. In which case, I'll offer him the barn until morning. Miss Murray went briskly to the door. I'll go with you, Meg's voice was shrill. No, Meg, you stay here with Charles and eat your sandwich. Eat, Meg exclaimed as Mrs. Murray went out through the lab. How does she expect me to eat? Mother can take care of herself, Charles said. Physically, that is. But he sat in Father's chair at the table and his legs kicked at the rungs. And Charles Wallace, unlike most small children, had the ability to sit still.